Divine Kings and Queens to the One in a Million show. Thank you so much for joining me on this lovely Saturday. I pray that your day is going well, productive. You are a blessed child of God. If you don't know, now you know. Um, I'm so excited to give today's word. Um, I have a few announcements as well, but you know we have to go into prayer. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you on today, God. God, we thank you for waking us up, Lord. Lord, I pray that each and every listener are blessed by your word, Lord. That your word encourage them to get through their day. That your word just show that your love is so faithful, God, towards us, God. That your grace is efficient for us, God, to keep going on throughout with our lives, Lord. Lord, we just bless your name because you are a holy God. Lord, I ask that you meet your children, whatever need that they have if they're if they're lacking in finances lord if they're lacking emotionally lord if they're lacking a mother lacking a father lord i ask that you be eat everything to them that they need right now in this time of need lord so lord we just bless your name god may you get all of the glory decrease in china malice or no light and increase in you holy spirit holy spirit have your way on today on the airwaves lord whatever state is tuning in on the radio lord i ask that you bless each listener Bless them richly with your word. Let them hear from you and not China. I'm just the voice. I am just the vessel, Lord. So, Lord, I just humbly come before you, just asking that you decrease in me. Holy Spirit, have your way on today, and we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I have some few announcements today. Some of you may know if you follow me on Facebook, but I want to let my radio family know as well. August 3rd, I celebrated two years on the radio. Woo! Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! So I thank God for that first and foremost. It's been a blessing being on the radio, and my mission is just to continue to teach and preach the truth living word of God by showing you in the word of God how it translates, how it correlates with how we live in today's society. Uh, one in a million is my baby. It actually was birthed in 2015 and now it's growing into its teenager stages. I guess you can say that. But one in a million started in 2015 as a Facebook page. But on August 3rd, I launched my official logo. Um, if you're on Facebook again, you will be able to see that information. And then my website was launched. So those of you that are listening on the radio, my official website, if you want to book me for speaking engagement, if you want me to pour into your youth, however God gives you the, the, the I'll say he gives you the alert to put me on your mind, this is how you can book me. This is how you can get in contact with me. W dot the one in a million show dot com. Once again, it is ww dot the one in a million show dot com. I also released my first batch of merchandise. I just want to say thank you to everyone who purchased within two days. I almost completely sold out. So that just that just shows that God is faithful, and I just appreciate the love, and I appreciate the support. I am going to be restocking soon, so I thank you for your patience. So please, guys, just make sure that you go to my website. Everything you want to know about me is on there, about how my ministry started. I am a licensed minister in the state of Ohio and under the leadership of Power and Faith Ministry. So everything that you need to know, spoken word artist, being a host, being a host on my radio show, everything you will see that on there, okay? I also want to announce Power and Faith Ministry Pastoral Anniversary is coming up and it's happening next week, Friday, August 13th through August 15th. We are going to have Quan Howell from the Sounds of Blackness coming to visit us from Columbus, Ohio. We'll also have Pastor Howard Williams from Victorious Life Christian Center also coming from Columbus, Ohio. And if you didn't know, we are celebrating Apostle Ron Banks and Pastor Jerry Banks on their 24th anniversary, pastoral anniversary. So you want to make sure that you are in the building. Tickets are selling fast. So you want to reserve your seat immediately. Then on August 14th on Saturday, we'll have Pastor Angelo and Veronica Petrucci coming from Higher Place Church, Nashville, Tennessee. And then we'll also have Bishop Anthony Spann from Potter House Ministries 
from Morristown, Tennessee. So we have a lot of people coming in from different states, different cities to celebrate with our pastors. If you want to join, you are more than welcome. Power and Faith is a big family, so we welcome each and every body who, who wants to come. You are welcome to come into our family and come and worship with us on this special occasion. If you need tickets, you can definitely call Benita Florence at 513-284-0949 and also Jamal McMillan at 513-696-2170. And this will be happening at 8120 Hamilton Avenue, Cincinnati, Ohio, in the Hilltop Plaza. And the banquet, which is going to be happening on Saturday, that is going to be at the Unico Event Center. So make sure you get your tickets ASAP. Don't say I didn't tell you because I've been mentioning it for quite a while now. So now we're about to get into this word. So if you are watching via Facebook, then you already see what today's topic is today. Topic of today is God can change tragedy to success. Once again, God can change tragedy to success. I'm going to try to get through this quickly, but I want you to get the meat of this word. So let's go ahead and start off by talking about what, what, uh, tragedy is. It is an event causing great suffering, according to Google Dictionary, destruction and distress, such as a serious accident, crime, or a natural disaster. It also can be a bad event that causes great sadness, a branch of drama that treats in a serious and dignified style the sorrowful or terrible events encountered or caused by a heroic individual. Now let's talk about success. Success is favorable or desired outcome, the favorable or prosperous terminations of attempts or endeavors, the accomplishments of one's goals, the attainment of wealth, position, honors, or the like. So we see that those two definitions are very different from each other. And we're going to talk about this in the book of Genesis. I was reminded of this story when I was trying to upload scripture of the week last week and I couldn't get it up. I was having so many complications with getting it up, and I just said, you know what, I'll do Scripture of the Week next time. I do that on Mondays, and this, what I was thinking about, it just stuck with me. And I want to visit this story. I believe that we're going to dive into the Scripture, and it's going to show us that God is not a magician. God is not a genie in a bottle that we rub this bottle and we ask for three wishes. No, God is not that. But what we will see today, that God is strategic. He's sovereign. And he's a covenant keeper. He's a covenant keeper. And we're going to see this in the book of Genesis. I want to go to Genesis 37, verse 1 through 3. And um, in this scripture, we can identify um, at this time, it's going to be a main character. And I don't want to say character because this is a true event. But the main person in this story is Joseph, okay? So um, we will see how he obtained favor from God and how in his specific personal life, how God changed his tragedy to success. And I believe that God can do that through each and every one of our lives. These things that people endured during the times of the Bible was just so crazy. And God used these crazy situations and turned them into miraculous miracles. So I want to go ahead and go to chapter 37. And I'm going to read through this and I'll break it down so we can get a clear understanding of what's going on. So I'll start up with uh, chapter 37, verse 1 through 3. It says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bila and Zippah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. So here we can already identify that Joseph was the... Uh, I'll say he was the favorite son. He was the son that was uh, was loved greatly uh, by Jacob because he was the son that he bore at a very old age. So that signified that he has a, a favoritism with him because of that. And um, I want to also clarify that with reading this story as I was studying, we have to understand that there's a royal bloodline in this. And what I mean by royal bloodline, 
uh, Joseph, uh, Je uh, Joseph is already indeed imparted into a royal bloodline because of the history of his forefathers, and we'll go ahead and talk about that. Now, Abraham was the father of Isaac. And then Isaac was the father of Jacob. And now at this point in the story, we see that Jacob was the father of Joseph. So we, if you're familiar with the story of Genesis, then you know that Abraham, from God, he was chosen to leave out of his country. But God made a significant promise to him. He said that you will be a father of many nations. And here we can already see that Joseph is connected in that bloodline. So if he is a father of many nations and Abraham was told from God that your generations are going to be blessed, then we know that Joseph, he's already going to be blessed because he's connected through this royal bloodline. And I thought that was so significant because if if, if Joseph is in this royal bloodline and we see the miracles and we see the promises that God kept with Abraham, then we already can tell and we already know that, oh, he's a part of this generation. So there has to be a blessing somewhere in this story, correct? All right. So moving on. Now, if we go to Genesis 37, verse 5 through 9, it says, Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheep arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his word. So in this particular passage that I just read, Genesis 37 verse 5 through 9, we see that Joseph is recalling the dream that he had about his brothers. And in this dream, uh, this dream is uh, showing that in a way that his brothers were uh, serving him in some way. So when he explains this dream to his brothers, they're looking at him like, okay, so what are you saying? Are you saying that we're going to reign? Are we going to bow down to you? We're going to worship? What are you saying? But Joseph goes on to continue with his dream. And this is where we see that the hatred and the jealousy starts to stem from this situation but in his but i want to go ahead and go to verse 9 as well it says here then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his fathers rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but but his father kept the saying in mind. What's so important is this last sentence. It says, but his father kept the saying in mind. What that clarifies, what that dignifies is, even though he was questioning Joseph about the very dreams that he had about his brother, and, and, and he, he seen that he was bowing, the brothers were bowing down to him, he kept in his memory. He said, even though he's telling him, like, why are you saying these such things that your brothers are going to do this and your brothers are going to do that? But he kept it in his mind because somewhere in his spirit, he felt that it was true. Somewhere in his spirit, he knew that his son wasn't lying. So he kept it with him because he knew that in the future, that this very dream that Joseph had will soon come to light. So in the scripture, it says, but his father kept the saying in his mind. Sometimes God will have people say things to you and it may sound absolutely crazy, but have you ever thought like, hmm, it sounds crazy what they said, but for some reason, I can't just get out of my mind. It just won't leave me. This is what his father was experiencing at this time when he told him this news. And he told him about this dream that he was having and the visions that God was showing him. And you also have to keep in mind, in Genesis, when they have these type of dreams, these were divine revelations. So Joseph was getting divine revelations straight from God. This was not something that he was making up. He wasn't trying to put himself on a pedestal and say, I'm going to 
to be above my brothers. They are going to serve me. Yes, he told them about his dream, but he wasn't putting himself on a pedestal, but he was simply letting them know this is what God was showing me. But it was his brothers that took it as a way of, oh, he thinks he's better than us. And that's what hatred start to root in their hearts. They started to hate his brother. Scripture already clarified that they started to be jealous of him. Verse 11 said, and his brothers were jealous of him. And hey, we can't help who God chooses to do his mission through. But this is what's happening with Joseph at this time. We're talking about how God can change tragedies into success. Now, Let's go read Genesis 37, 12 through 17 real quick. It says, now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers pastoring the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to them, here I am. So he said to him, go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock and bring the word. So basically he sent Joseph out to check on his brothers to make sure that they were doing what they were supposed to do with the family's flock that they were raising. That's all he sent him to do. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and he came to Shechem and a man found him wandering in the fields and the man asked him, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brother. So at this time he's, he's encountered by a stranger and the stranger said, what are you doing out here again? Keep in mind Joseph was 17 years old, so he must have been younger than this man. He said, well, what are you doing wandering out here? He said, I'm looking for my brothers. And then he says, he said, tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. This is when the story gets very interesting. Verse 18 says, they saw him from afar, and before he came to them, they conspired against him to kill him. If you didn't catch that, I'm going to read it again. This is coming from his own brothers. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer, so they're mocking him now. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into the pits, into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard, which is one of the older brothers, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him out of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and there was no water in it. So here we see the very brother Joseph, the Joseph who was having these dreams of his brothers going to be serving him in the near future they became jealous so they took joseph their blood flesh brother they took him and they wanted to uh, uh kill him they plotted to conspire against him because they were so jealous do you know that there are so many people that can see that the favor of god is on you and want to plan and destroy the plans that god has for you but god is so powerful he can destroy those plans in the nick of dying no matter how hard they try and then it says in verse 25 it says then they sat down to eat and looking up they saw a caravan of ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, ball, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Now, one thing to keep in mind about the Ishmaelites is that they were traitors. They were actually traitors. What that means is they went around trading things. They went around traveling, trading things. And so when the brothers of Joseph saw them, and actually they were heading down uh, towards the south of Egypt. So when the brothers saw him travel, saw the uh, Ishmaelites traveling down to Egypt, they thought to themselves, okay, and I'm just talking for... Um, uh, paraphrasing right now for the sake of time, but when they saw the traders coming, they said, hey, let's go ahead and trade Joseph. Let's, let's uh, uh, sell him into slavery. And that's where his tragedy began to happen. We see that Joseph is now sold into slavery. Again, he's coming from a foreign land. He was raised in Canaan. Now they're taking him to Egypt to be a slave. And he was sold to Potiphar, which was, uh, he was an official server of, uh, um, 
Pharaoh. So we see what's going on here. Joseph, he, his tragedy is starting to become, but we're going to see how God can still manifest in the midst of a tragedy and make us successful, just like he did with Joseph. So let's go here. I feel the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So in Genesis 39, again, for the sake of time, I'm just fair, uh, uh, paraphrasing, Joseph uh Joseph was favored. He was uh he ended up being successful. If you read further along in uh chapter 39, he began to be the uh uh kind of like a leader uh in the Egyptian uh master in his household. He seemed favored, he seen that the Lord was with him, so he made him uh, like a you can say as uh he was like one of the best servers in the house of the for the uh, master at this time. And then uh what happens after this is then Potiphar wife falsely accused Joseph of trying to sleep with her. And I, if I can say it in a more uh, prettier term, tried to have an intimate relationship with her. But Joseph denied the wife. He, he denies Potiphar's wife. So here we have a second, a second tragedy that's about to happen. So when this news was brought about to Potiphar, guess what Potiphar did? He said, you were trying to get with my wife? He sent them to prison. So here we have a boy that was 17 years old. He was sold into slavery by his own flesh and blood, his brothers. Then a second tragedy comes. He had got favor from the Lord. He's working in the master's house. Now he's being thrown to prison because he's falsely accused of trying to have an intimate relationship with Potiphar's wife when it was the wife that was trying to get him. He didn't want any dealings with him. In fact, in scripture, and again, I'm paraphrasing, it tells him, how can I sin against God? This is a wicked thing. I could never do anything like that. And she was mad because in the Bible, it also described Joseph as being a very handsome man. So she liked him. She was attracted to him. So when he cut her off or denied her, she got mad and accused him of falsely trying to get with her. Now let's move on. So now, even though now we know we're at the part that Joseph is in prison. Now he's in prison. It's like, okay, God, you showed me dreams. If I was if I was Joseph back in that time, I would be thinking like, but God, I remember you showing me dreams of my brother serving me. I remember you showing me that I will be favored. Can you think of what might have been going through his psyche at this time? I'm sold into slavery. Then I, everything was going good. I'm in my master's house. I'm serving. I'm over the other servants. Now I'm kicked into prison. God, what are you doing with my life? How can this tragedy turn into success? Please answer me, God. So in prison. Then he became favored in prison later on if you read the story. And he was able to interpret dreams of two prisoners that were also in prison with him. And again, I'm paraphrasing. There came a time when Pharaoh, Pharaoh had a dream. He was the king of the time at Egypt. Then he had a dream that he could not interpret. So the two prisoners' dreams that he uh, interpreted, one of them remembered like, I know this guy named Joseph. He can interpret dreams, Pharaoh. Maybe you can call him out. He's in the prison. So Pharaoh requested that Joseph come up and interpret his dream. And I'm making a long story short. I'm making a condensed version. But I, I really encourage you to read this story because it's so encouraging. But what he then says is, okay, interpret the dream. So he gives him a chance to interpret the dream. What the dream ended up meaning was... There was going to be a famine for seven years. But first, there was going to be a harvest for seven years. A plentiful harvest. But then seven years, there was going to be a famine where there was no food available. There was going to be anything over the land. But he told them a strategic way of what they needed to do. So they started storing up food throughout those seven years. So that when the famine did come, Egypt wouldn't be without. So when that time, when that time came of the famine... People were looking for food everywhere. There was no food to be found. There was no food to be found. But Joseph, when he interpreted his dream, Pharaoh was pleased. And guess what? <laughs> guess what? Joseph rose to power again. He rose to power again. He was favored by God. God can change tragedy to success. And we're going to read about that quickly in verse 41, verse 40 through 5. This is what it says here. Verse 40 through 5. It says, you shall, this is Pharaoh talking to Joseph. Keep in mind, now, because he interprets the dream, Pharaoh is pleased with this. He said, this makes sense. I know this is from God. Okay, so this is what he do with Joseph. He said, you shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. He's giving them power. 
This is favored. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you all over the land of Egypt. Come on. We're talking about a man who was sold to Egypt. Now he's being a, the leader, the ruler of Egypt. That's turning tragedy into success. That is a God. That is a powerful God. That is a covenant keeping God. Now it says, then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. This is a physical adoration of you are placed in and the high power back in those days when they had a signet ring I believe when I studied it's always placed on the pinky finger but it signified power so now Joseph is in a place of power we're talking about coming from slavery being sold into slavery now he is the ruler of Egypt come on we're talking about a God that can turn tragedies to success then it says here, verse 43, and he made him ride in his second chariot, and they called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him over the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And I apologize if I get this name correct, but Pharaoh also said, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zapaneth Panea, and he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went out of the land of Egypt. I'm sorry, it says, so Joseph, so Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. This man um, came from being a prisoner. Now he is the ruler over Egypt. Now this man has a wife. Now this man is rich. Now this man is put in high power. God can change a story in the nick of a dime. I say this a lot because I don't think we quite understand the type of God that we serve. This man was sold into Egypt. To be a slave by his own brothers in this very country that he was put into slavery. Now he has set a ruler over it. That tells us that whatever promise or whatever provision that God gives us that is going to come to pass, it has to come to pass. God is a man that shall not lie. So whatever he told Joseph was coming to pass at this time. And then further along, if you read around the story, the famine there came. And who do you think came showing up at the door? His brothers. His brothers that sold him to slavery. And if you read the last of the story, it talks about how Joseph ended up being the pillar for the family because he saved them all from dying. They could have died from starvation because there was a famine all over the land. And God used Joseph in that mighty way. And if you read the scriptures further on, they did end up bowing down to him, just like he said in the dream. So God is a promise keeper. God can change tragedy to success. I want to give you some advice of the day. Advice of the day is God can restore, God can replenish, and God can rebuild his people. God bless you all. I will see you next Saturday on the One in a Million show. Thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you all. I love you.